So Victoria, one of the reasons why I wanted to meet with you today is that every time I talk to somebody who's a musician, who's a music artist, or somebody that's been around live performing artists, your name comes up in conversation. Mm -hmm. Your name is always spoken of with a great deal of reverence and respect. And when I did research on you and I went to your website, one of the things that I discovered very quickly is that you are about your craft and about your business. And then I looked and I was like, of course she's about her business. She's got a bachelor's in a classical piano performance. She's got a master's in classical piano performance from Stanford. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, of course she's going to be about her business because she's trained, she's dedicated, she's focused. So when I wanted to talk to you about live performance, about what an artist can do to prepare themselves to do the things that you've done. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk to you about the insights that you could provide so that other people who want to become someone who backs up Stevie Wonder, <laughs> who puts out their own CDs, who decides to go ahead and give vocal lessons and piano lessons. You wear all these different hats. You're doing this full time. You are a success. So really, that's what the basis of the conversation is about. And I want to start with this just one question. Mm -hmm. What motivated you to use classical piano as your basis? I love it. That's really what drew, what drew me to classical. I started piano really young. I was mm -hmm. maybe two years old when I started playing just by ear. Mm -hmm. And I started piano lessons at 12. And the teacher that I had was the first African-American piano instructor in the East Bay, as far as I know, mm -hmm. Laura Toom Scott. And she was probably 85 when I started lessons with her. Wow. She lived at well over 100. And she exposed me to classical literature. And okay. I fell in love with it. And so I played it because it was in my heart. And I loved it. And I progressed from there. Okay. And so with, with, classical, with the classical training, mm -hmm. clearly the uh, emphasis on composition, arrangement, and theory. How has that benefited you in comparison to what you see people lacking who may not have that training? Well, one, it provided a basis for technique. Okay. Right? Because when you, to be able to ap approach the classical, especially the virtuoso literature, okay. you have to have the technique to do it. Okay. So there's all sorts of training to prepare you for that. The theory prepares you to understand the music so that you can express it in a way that makes sense. Okay. And that feeds over into everything that I do. Okay. So how do you go from Stanford getting the master's in cl classical piano performance to being on the road with three, five, seven. <laughs> how, do, yeah. how does that work? That happened because I responded to an advertisement for an audition. Okay. And I walked into the room. Like I said, I've been playing since I was about two mm -hmm. by ear. So my ear is really good. Okay. And so that audition involved listening and playing back. So that's easy for me. Okay. And I'm a dancer too. So oh. the fact that I could play and dance at the same time is oh, okay. to my advantage. All right. Now, I don't see any, any videos of you dancing online or anything. Watch some but of the, the DVD. Maybe yeah. some YouTube stuff, right? Yeah. Okay. There's plenty of dancing with Stevie. Okay. Okay. And so that situation with 357, how long did that last? Um, Just about two years. Okay. And how did you enjoy it? I was fine. Okay. Yeah, I toured all over the United States with them. Um, We did a music video down right. in Los Angeles. Okay. I did a bunch of music festivals okay. with them. It was a lot of fun. And if you had to say the one lesson that you learned from that particular experience, what would it be? As a touring musician, to remain focused. Okay. Because I won't name any names, but there are people who participate in lifestyles that weren't conducive to maintaining yourself 
on, on the road. So speaking of the amount of time that you put in to practicing your craft, yeah. let's talk about that a little bit. Mm-hmm. How important is it for someone to spend time practicing their craft and how much time do you recommend that they put into it? I'll put it this way. In high school, I practiced three to four hours a day on top of coursework. And in college, I practiced six to eight hours a day on top of coursework. So Six to eight hours a day? A day, yeah. Okay, so some people might say that that's a bit much, right? People who don't understand what it takes. <laughs> people who don't understand what it takes to get to where you are and do the things that you've yeah. done. Yeah. So would you say that's normal? Are normal say, for people who have achieved like you? Yes, normal for people who have achieved. Okay. Normal for the people that I know that I tour with, especially in their education phase. Mm-hmm. And then once you get to be a professional, there's other things to consider. Okay. But as a student, okay. especially if you don't have to provide for yourself, if you okay. live with parents or if you live at a college where you know your expenses are lower, right, right. take advantage of your time. Right, right. Like, don't go to the movies every night. Okay. <laughs> don't sit and watch TV. Okay. Okay, so we're, so we're so we're talking about we're talking about discipline. We're talking about structure. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. We're talking about conscientious choice. Yes. Right. So one of the things that I've talked to people about in this series, and I actually talked to my students about at San Francisco mm-hmm. State, is this whole law of ten thousand hours. Yeah. And people, it's pretty popular now. This notion. Sure. Right. Um, but one of the things that typically gets left out in those discussions mm-hmm. is deliberate practice and the type of practice. So yeah. if you're putting in the six to eight hours, right. what type of practice do you recommend people do so that they're practicing properly? Um, well, if you're talking about a, an R&B artist, or R&B artist, somebody, or... somebody who's, let's say piano, cause that's your instrument. Sure. Okay. Well, as a classical pianist, you, you want to practice your technical, okay. right? So that you can play the virtuoso music, which mm. is extremely difficult to okay. do. Once you've gotten that out of the way, then you focus on expressing to be able to play a particular pattern okay. and have it sing. Right, because you don't want to play something robotically. Okay. Right, you want to be able to play it in a way that it moves you first. Ah, and that's where the emotive that, comes absolutely. from. Absolutely. Right? So that mo- that that feeling in your heart that okay. you feel when you play is what you offer to the people okay. that are listening too. So you have to practice that. You have okay. to practice getting out of your head and getting out of the idea that I've got to get every single note right. Right. Because that's irrelevant. Yeah. If that was important, people would watch robots play. Right. Okay? Yeah. But hmm. they want to have the feeling. You practice it technically, so you can do it. Right. But then. And you have to also practice feeling it while you play it. Now, that's interesting you would say that because I've actually heard singers talk mm-hmm. about being too technical mm-hmm. when they're actually, you know, emoting a certain vowels and sounds. But I've never heard someone talk about playing in such a robotic way to where that can be heard. I guess that's really a matter of being able well, to train yeah, the ear for that. It's the that. same thing. Like if you put it this way, when I talk to my students, okay. I, I put it this way. If I'm talking to you with a monotone voice, it's not very interesting, is it? No. No. So <laughs> I can still talk to you. Right. I practiced enough that I can speak English pretty right. well. <laughs> right. Right. And I can express myself and my voice can go up and down and it responds. Right. M- what I'm saying to you is based on what I feel. Okay. Right? So if I feel passionate about something, maybe my voice will go up. And I'll get a little louder. I'll gesticulate in a particular way, right? So that's emoting and, and right. expressing at the same time. And I'm using the technique of articulation, right? <laughs> and choosing my words consciously, right? Right. So it's the same thing for music. So I, I practice the notes. I practice the dynamics. You know, whether it's loud or soft, right. articulation. If I'm playing in a percussive way or in a in a smooth, even way, right. But then, really, what is music? It's communicating. And expression. Anytime you do it, communicate, it has to involve expression ah, if okay. you want to be effective. Right. So, it's the that, same. that works for me. That works for me. So, yeah, thank you for explaining that because <laughs> I definitely feel enlightened. And, and to the issue of practice, there's this one other component, mm-hmm. which I want you to speak to, which I think that not enough of the younger generation um, seeks out, and that's called feedback. So the whole 10,000 hours, deliberate practice, Mm -hmm. but you don't really hear people saying how important it is to get feedback. Who are the people that have given you feedback that has benefited you and how important is it to get that feedback? It's crucial. You know, I heard someone once say, you know, Tiger Woods is still considered the greatest golfer Mm -hmm. probably ever. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And he has a coach. Okay. Right. So I go get coaching now and then 
just because it's good to have that feedback. Growing up, my teachers, Eugene Gash was excellent. Janice Maxie Reed, okay. an excellent teacher. Bill Bell, excellent. You know, in college, I had Zedmara Zakarian Rutstein, a <laughs> Russian lady. She was my teacher. And she was. She'd be proud tough. of how you said her name, too. She'd be very yeah. proud. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm a little bit Russian. Yes. But, <laughs> anyway, all those people gave me great feedback. And I remember at uh, Zedmara at, at Oberlin, mm. at my first lesson, when I played for her, mm. she said to me, and I thought that I did great. You know, I was a little little star here in the Bay Area in the Young Musicians Program okay. when I was a teen. And after I played for her at my first lesson, she said to me, how did you get in? You're not good enough. Really? She did. That was quite some feedback, right? Whoa. <laughs> so I took Whoa. that feedback. And sure, it hurt. But I wanted it enough uh -huh. that I made it my point okay. to prove to her that she was wrong. Oh, and I got your I motivation, huh? Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so I just, it just made me work. Okay. And maybe that's what I needed to hear. Nice, nice. <laughs> so I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, how did the whole connection with Stevie Wonder come about? Like, when did that happen? How did it happen? And how have you enjoyed that experience? In August 2007, mm -hmm. I came out of my yoga class, because I'm a yogi. Okay. <laughs> And I had a text message from someone saying, call this phone number, Stevie Wonder's looking for a keyboard player. And I thought, this must be a joke. Uh -huh. So I went home, I called the number, and it turned out to be legitimate. Okay. And the way that I even got considered was I had a MySpace page, which was the big deal at the time. And I reached out to a lot of people in the industry uh -huh. and... I had little clips of me playing classical music on it. Okay. And so I went to L.A. Okay. And I auditioned with nine. There were nine of us all together. So I auditioned with eight other people. Mm -hmm. And everyone else there had resumes in the R&B world. You know, and I was coming from that very week okay. playing with the Oakland Symphony Chorus. <laughs> playing classical music. A little different background. A little different. <laughs> But as I said earlier, I have a very developed ear. Right. So I can hear and play pretty much anything I hear. Mm -hmm. And that was to my advantage. And again, being a dancer, I can feel music, right, in a way that is to my advantage. Right. So I went and auditioned for four days. And each day, fewer and fewer people were invited back. <laughs> okay. Okay. And on that last day, August the 13th, 2006. Oh, you remember vividly. I, how could I forget? That really was a great day. Um, I was told that I got the job. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So there was this weeding out process. And so you've been with him now for six years. Oh, it'll be six years in August. Six years. Yeah. And so how has that experience improved you as a musician? I see the fact that he has a keyboard everywhere he goes. Okay. And he's constantly playing, constantly working on new compositions. Right. Practicing. He right. does vocal exercises. He's Stevie Wonder. And gotcha. he practices. Uh -huh. So for all the young artists out there that think that they don't have to work, no. Because you get to a certain level. Right. No. You don't understand. Mm. He's at, he's beyond the top. <laughs> he could have retired 20 years ago. Right. Okay? Right. But he still pushes it. He still sings everything in the original keys. Who, who does that? Right. You know? So his work ethic, his heart that he shares with every audience that right, we perform for, right. that he shares with us in the band. We're like a family. Wow. And it's a beautiful thing. So I, I learn a lot from just being around him and the other musicians in the band. Everyone is extremely talented. So, so Victoria, give me like three takeaway tips that people who are aspiring to do the things that you've done, three things that they can do to make that possible. Sure. Okay. The first tip is be prepared. Practice and then practice more. Then once you think you have it, practice again. <laughs> Back to practice, 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 <laughs> right? Gotcha. You can't get away from that. There's no way around it. All right. The second tip is override your ego. Treat people with respect, be humble, professional, and on time. On time. Mm -hmm. hmm. I can't tell you how many people have been fired because they lacked respect, lacked humility, lacked professionalism, and were late consistently. Don't be late. 
Hmm. Be on time. Sounds good. Yep. The third tip is work hard. A successful music career is far more difficult than you could imagine. It is more challenging than having a regular job. It is more demanding than many other careers and requires a devotion, discipline, and focus that is unrelenting and unsustainable for most people. But if you do the work, few careers are as satisfying. Wow. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. Good. So thank you so much for the time that you've given us today because I know you probably got some practice you need to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you much for your time and uh, I look forward to seeing you in concert. Mm-hmm.